So, good evening, everyone. Really welcome to be here to present uh, our work. So, I'm from Tampere University, campus of uh, Hervanta, and uh, I'm working with uh, Cari Sesta, Valentina, uh, Francesco, and several other guys from the university. So, what I'm presenting, we are providing you a kind of very high level overview of our uh, part of our research, not everything, of course. Uh, on uh, data-driven software engineering. So using machine learning uh, to predict uh, some kind of quality of the development process uh, or, or the product quality uh, that we can do using different tools. Uh, so we are gonna present uh, uh, data-driven software engineering, what is, why we are doing that. So, uh, our continuous monitoring data ops platform. So we are building uh, this platform uh, step by step. Uh, and then uh, we will present uh, the main topic, uh, so predicting faults uh, using uh, sonar cube rules. Uh, so Valentina will present it as part of, uh, as main contributor of this work. Uh, and uh, current work from our PhD student Francesco Nudi, that unfortunately she's not here. So software visualization, anomaly detection, and analyzing dependent data uh, with machine learning. And finally, of course, conclude. So the presentation will be performed by me and uh, Valentina. I'm. Uh, Assistant professor in university. She is a postdoc researcher here in uh, Hervanta. Yes, with career supervisor. <laughs> so uh, Valentina is working on data analysis, machine learning. Uh, especially, she has a main focus on data analysis and the pl application of uh, statistical techniques. Uh, uh, software quality, software maintenance, and everything related to technical depth. And on my side, uh, I, have, I have similar skills, but especially I'm working mainly on cloud and uh, web software engineering, so how to architect uh, a proper system uh, when you want to migrate to cloud, when you want to migrate to something like microservice or new web architectures, uh, cloud native patterns, anti-patterns, uh, how to migrate, how to not migrate, something related to that one. So what is data-driven software engineering? Uh, our goal is to deliver software, but we want to deliver software on time. So I think this is something that everybody wants to do it. I think that's the ultimate goal of every company, except that probably you also want to make profit on the top of that. So we know from several very famous reports that more than 60% of companies usually deliver on delay. They're, they are not able to deliver on time, and half of the software crash in production that's real fact. How many of you ever had a crash in production? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of normal. Uh, most of the software has bugs, most of the software crashes. Uh, so what's the solution? Nowadays, a lot of people would say, do agile. But uh, to be honest, uh, I disagree. I think the solution is measure and experiment. So you can be agile. But what's important on top of that is that you must measure, you must experiment, you must learn what to measure, how to do things, uh, and uh, how to better improve your, uh, your process. Oh, thank you, sorry. How to better, I mean, do your process. So for example, it's like your body. How do you know if you are healthy or not healthy? How do you know if you are overweight or not overweight? Uh, you need to measure something. You need to measure yourself. You can even use your belt uh, sides to measure yourself, your trouser sides to have a kind of idea. But without a kind of reference model, you, you will never know if you are fat or if you are thin, if you are good or if you are bad. And think about other measures. So this is kind of easily measured. Think about, about uh, glucose, uh, value of your blood. You know if you have a diabetes or not. You need to make a blood exam. So, and when you make a blood exam, you will have some number, like you have 80, uh, 80 information from your glucose. Is it good or bad? Who knows? Someone did some study in the past, uh, and biology is pretty famous, in medicine is famous, they did stu in studies to understand uh, the good threshold uh, for glucose. But it's the same for every kind of uh, value that you have in your blood. So this is what we are doing in uh, software engineering, try to understand uh, what is good, what is bad, which values are acceptable in different uh, points of view. And the question is uh, what to measure. So we are facing the same issue that has been faced uh, a couple of hundred years ago in biology. So okay, they have the blood information. What can we measure from the blood? The color or uh, I don't know, the temperature. And the same is in a um, different process. So shall we measure the time spent, uh, the remaining, remaining time? Shall we measure the number of faults? Uh, shall we measure other information? And uh, we can measure something over time. We can measure data series, how something is evolving. Is evolving good, bad? 
So does this black means we are going good, and does this spike means good or, or not good? So, and how can we measure? Shall we measure and shall we consider the cumulative? This is exactly the same. So shall we consider the cumulative or shall we consider just the individual trend? Or shall I just go down in deep and consider the low granularity of a zoom in of a single small process? This is exactly the same process, the same information uh, that she will introduce a little bit better. Okay, now, now let's imagine we understand what to measure and how to measure. How can I analyze them? Shall I use a linear regression? Shall I use a, a multivariate regression? Shall I use machine learning or a bagging system? Can I use bagging? Can I use boosted models? Can I use uh, deep learning? Are my variables uh, um, dependent or independent? Is my data uh, dependent or not. So, shall I cut this in between because it was stable, or shall I not cut this in between? I mean, this is a big problem of interpreting our data, and this is what we are trying to solve in our work. So, try to get out from the context and understanding what, how, when, and in which way to measure, and finally, how to visualize. So, okay, we have good numbers, we have good value. How can I visualize them? So, shall I use uh, Something like Grafana to use it. Uh, okay, cool. This is just a tool. It's not important the tool, but it's important what you want to measure. Is this effective? Does this provide the right information that you need uh, to steer your development process or to understand if something goes wrong or right? Uh, or maybe it's better this visualization. That's exactly the same process, just visualize in a different way. So we don't know. We want to try to help companies to understand what and how to measure. And for that, we are developing uh, what we call uh, the continuous monitoring uh, data ops uh, platform. So our goal is to collect uh, information from software development process, any development process. So we want to collect uh, every possible information in one single repository that then can be used by data scientists uh, to make predictions or to study what uh, can be a good prediction model. We collect quality information, we collect runtime data, and we have so many data sets available. We have data sets available from any DevOps tool. So we have data sets uh, from software quality, something like static, static um, analysis tools, uh, SonarCube, Coverity Q1, but there are hundreds of that. Uh, we have developer tools, something, uh, sorry, development tools or DevOps tools. Uh, we have issue trackers. Uh, we have continuous building, uh, continuous monitoring tools. Uh, but we have also tools that analyze metadata or meta information. I think some of you probably know about this periodic table of DevOps elements, uh, but that's a very famous uh, table from uh, uh, Xibia Labs. Uh, they simply represent uh, all the different DevOps tools uh, in one single classification using uh, the periodic element. But from any of these tools, we can get some data. All of them produce something. All of them has open API. So we can grab this information to predict uh, some relevant information. So they are not just uh, tools. They are not data sets. They are something in between. I mean, some people use it as tools. We use as data sets. As, and what we do? We take some of this tool, for example. We take some exception monitoring from Sentry. We take exception information. We take issues uh, from Jira. We take information from commits, uh, information from Jenkins, uh, so text uh, execution, building stability, whatever we want to have. We take information from SonarCube, we combine them in the proper way. We try to understand how, when, and why to combine them. And with some prediction model, we provide recommendation to developers. So for example, uh, never do this kind of uh, technical violation, never do this, never write uh, uh, more than three nested methods, uh, never write more than three nested uh, if, if for your specific case, it's not suitable. But those models can be trained for every single development team. So, so the idea is to put something in between. We have all the tools. Uh, this is just a very small example, but we actually have something like more than 20 possible tools to extract this data. We collect the data with our data platform model, and then we, have, we provide this information to the data scientists or the researcher that will uh, work on them, work on this data, and provide uh, the prediction models uh, that then will be used to developers for providing the recommendation. So what we are doing, this is the very, very high level architecture of what we are doing. We simply have a cron job here that is listening, that is like checking every single day 
any possible information about the projects we monitor. So if there is a new commit, if there is a new fault, if there is a new issue, a new exception, anything that comes from all the DevOps tools that we actually are monitoring. If there is a new event, send it to the message bus, and then we have a set of tools, uh, and you can add all the tools from Xibia Labs uh, here that collects all the information and creates a single huge data set that will be stored there in the Postgres data storage. So that's just very, very high level uh, information. We have everything stored as Docker containers, uh, but the cool part is that uh, up to now, usually researchers, developers had to do everything by hand from scratch. So they just write API, they extracted information from Jira, from Jenkins, uh, from GitHub, they did their own script, uh, and then they just wrote a paper saying, okay, this issue is much better than that issue, this is a problem, that is not a problem. What we want to do is something that can collect all the information runtime, automatically retrain the system, and reapply the machine learning models developed by the researcher, and continuously provide feedback to developers without needing uh, of uh, manual um, implementations. So one example of this uh, is uh, what now Valentina is gonna present you. So we instantiated this case, uh, or this, the results of this platform uh, using uh, uh, SonarCube. So the idea was to predict uh, if there were a set of rules uh, that can help uh, to reduce the number of faults. What we did was like an allergy test. I like to call it allergy test. So when you do the allergy test, what you do? You just put some kind of chemical on your, uh, on your arm and you check if you start having a reaction. Then when you remove it, after a while, you should not have the same reaction anymore. So it should not be red anymore. You want to do the same. I want to see if uh, the introduction of a specific technical violation commonly introduced also a fault. Okay. And when the fault, <laughs> when the fault is removed, uh, if uh, you want to check if the re removal of the fault uh, is also corresponding to the removal of the same violation. But now I want to give the stage to my colleague Valentina. Good morning, I'm Valentina, and uh, as David told before, now I explain to you one particular case, uh, one particular case study that we conduct with the Sonar Cube in order to analyze the um, the accuracy of the model uh, provided by Sonar Cube in order to identify the predicting faults in the source code. What we can see that now is uh, the, um, the dashboard that Sonar Cube provides to the customer. Uh, we know that more than uh, 100k organizations adopt SonarCube at the moment. However, uh, SonarCube defines a standard rule set that are adopted also by the 98% of the public project. What, uh, what prescribes uh, uh, SonarCube? The technical depth uh, that SonarCube calculate is based on code compliance of 2002 rules, 2002 rules about Java project. If you now go inside the website of SonarCube, you can recognize that probably in the last, uh, in the next two months, they will uh, provide other rules and became more than 500 rules. According to us, are too much especially because uh, the usefulness of this rule is not clear. And it's also not clear the root of cause of this fault, because it's impossible to identify the root cause of faults without conducting a control experiment. And control experiment is very invasive for the company, it's difficult to conduct, and sometimes it's the last case study that you can have. And also for this reason, there is not empirical validation about the real uh, fall proneness or other kind of uh, external quality, software quality, you can measure about the sonar cube rules. Just an, an overview what sonar cube classifies as rules. Sonar cube defines three kind of different rules, uh, bug, cause melts, and security vulnerability. Take into account the bugs, sonar cube declare a strange declaration, zero false positive are expected from bugs. What means? That SonarCube 
it's able with the, the positional alcohol of uh, 100% per percent to uh, retrieve and identify correctly bugs. It's difficult to, to think that is uh, true because it's impossible. There are some mistakes that can happen. It's, it's, it's strange. And of course, also for COSMEL and security vulnerability, they declare that are the best to uh, retrieve and identify correctly. What we did with Davide and uh, also with Francesco, we tried to, uh, first of all, uh, assess the prediction accuracy of the sonar Q model, because it's important. If you declare that you are able to retrieve, to identify with the the, I, the maximum uh, precision recall that you can have, we would like to be sure. Because Sonar Cube, they cl claim that whenever a violation is classified as bug, a fault will, div will uh, develop in the software. Secondly, based of course on the results of the first research question, we, wa we wanted to identify the full proneness of the all sonar cube rules that introduce a fault and uh, fix it the, after the fixing of the fault. This is, could be help the practitioner in understanding which are the violations that commonly generate fault independently from the classification. Because our assumption is also that the classification that sonar cube provides to the developers, because male bug and vulnerability are not properly organized in the correct way. Um, we conduct a case study, of course, based on the historical data that we have about 21 open source projects from the Apache Software Foundation. And in this case, we select randomly according to um, protocol that are defined in the, in the case of empirical software engineering that help to have uh, a good example of the samples of the project that, do, that we have in Apache Software Foundation. We analyze more than uh, eight, uh, 80K uh, analyzed commit, 37 billion of live no code, and 1.4 million of violation retrieved. Of course, uh, the, the contents are Apache Software Foundation. We use Jira as issue tracker tool. GitHub and SonarCube as a um, tool for the analyze the code compliance. This is more or less what we did. Based with the instruction uh, of the issues tracker Jira and GitHub, we uh, have the information about the commit that we label through as the ZZ algorithm that is the most used in, in uh, software engineering. We label it the commit and we calculate the residual analysis. Residual analysis means then we must be sure that the uh, issues that introduce the fault and the issues that remove the fault. And in, in parallel, we label the commit through SonarCube uh, violation analysis and we analyze uh, with the different uh, uh, machine learning techniques such as logistic regression, the Chison tree, random forest, gradient boost, extreme random tree, other boost, XG boost. We uh, conduct a set of training in order to identify the best model, and we uh, choose the results only if they, um, through an overall validation, satisfy both. The residual analysis with uh, a percentage measure of the 95% in order to be sure about the confidence of the labeling commit and the analysis of the best model. Can I ask a question? Yeah? Uh, so, how much labeling is done by hand? So, the uh, question was. So I'm sorry if you are going to that, but comet labeling, is, the, is it done by hand or how are you doing that? Uh, by hand, manually. By hand? Hand. With the ZZ the, the, the algorithm, not by, by, by myself. With the using of the algorithm. Are you going to go deeper in that one? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 
about the first inducing common labeling, just to explain to you what we did, we apply as a ZZ algorithm without any kind of change, because our goal was not to improve the algorithm. And uh, since it's the common approach adopted by more than uh, 1,000 research work in our domain, we obtained the data from the issue tracker and the Git, and through the, the application of the SZZ algorithm, we have the data composed by two information, fall fixing commit and fall inducing commit. Just an example, they probably can better explain to you. These come from Jira issue tracker. From Jira, Jira issue tracker, we have the, this data, the type of the technical issues that we have in the code, for example, bug, the priority, critical, and other kind of information such as status resolved. If you go here, you see the, num the name of the project, Ambari, and this code that is for us the co key, the, you know, the co key sorry, in order to map with who? With GitHub. In GitHub, we have information about the commit message, this uh, identificator, and the commit, the commit message as the developer wrote have a mapping, an automatic mapping between uh, these two information, we, are, are, uh, we were sure that this was the commit that fixed the bug because there is the, the, same, uh, uh, the same information. And now we have about the information about the fixing. In order to identify the commit that introduced the bug, we go we go back on the past and we identify, of course, using the, um, the, the key identification, the fault in using commit. After that, we are sure who is uh, the commit A2D7C9E57 that induce the fault fixing in the commit uh, uh, with the green uh, um, square. This is an example. The algorithm considers the file change by the fixing commit, and with the blame in the lines involved in considering the full reporting date, we are able to retrieve the false inducing commit. This is the sample. This, uh, based on having this one, now we calculate the residual analysis. We have the violation introduced in the fault inducing commit, and the violation removed in the false fixing commit, what's happened in the past, respecting to the inducing of the fault. This is just to explain it. It'll be better that we can have three cases. The residual measure at zero, that means the violation introduced in the fault inducing commit, residual equal to zero, violation introduced in the fault inducing commit and the remove in the fault fixing commit, residual Mm, less than zero means violation removed in the full fixing commit. And we take, of course, the, the value in the middle. This is the formula, of course, for calculating residual sum of square and percentage of zero residual. And we consider violation where zero residual are measure or equal than 95%. This is an example of the application of, uh, for applying our machine learning technique. We have the commit ID, the label uh, that in 0, 1 in binary mode about for fixing commit, and the feature violation 1, violation 2, until violation n with uh, a cross in order to identify the, pres that identify the present of the violation. As I told before, we apply these uh, three uh, machine learning technique, and we also uh, uh, calculate the recursive rec feature elimination. In order to answer our research question, this is the results about the model that SonarQ provide. Bug violation were introduced in the 1% of the analyzed commit, 
And this is the result about the accuracy. This is the confusion matrix. In the other case, it's the um, uh, value of the accuracy measure. You can see that the sonar Q model at this moment, at the moment that we perform the, analy the, ana the analysis, is not the best model that you can use. Uh, because, of course, uh, you have uh, uh, an, accuracy, an accuracy value very, very low. And we don't just use the precision error call, but we also the McCabe and F measure that are the most used the accuracy measure in software engineering. This is the uh, AUC for the SonarQ model that is equal to 50%. It is more or less a random guess just for the the beginning, but is of course unacceptable. What we can say that the SonarQ model needs to be customized, and then does SonarQ provide a set to actually for prone's rule? We are not sure for this reason. We investigate, we, we, we make an, um, a, a picture about the diffusionness, and we can find that in the very vast majority of the cases, the introducing and fault-inducing commit are also fixed and removed. And uh, can we predict, uh, without using the uh, SonarQ model uh, through the application of machine learning technique? Yes, this is the result. In this case, we didn't use SonarQ model we just uh, pick up all the violation, consider all the violation, and apply the same set of machine learning technique. This is the result. The best one X is GBoost, but you can see also that the other one, uh, apart the season three, have uh, an AOC acceptable. This means that, uh, again, proof that Sonar Cube need to be customized again. This is the comparison between machine learning and the residual analysis, what we did. We consider the, uh, the residual measure in equal to 95% and also the uh, RFE using the, the cross. In this case, in yellow, you can see the violation that pass both what we can do, for example, what can see, for example, that the, viol the violation that really fold inducing and fold fix that, that are prone to uh, have a fault introduced inside the code have a low importance value. For example, the squid 112, that is the more current in, uh, in every work we are doing, has an importance of 0.11. That means that our fault create a fault with a low, really low importance. But the uh, very unexpected results, uh, it's related with the type, because it's not classified as bug. It's a cause males. What means? That's on a cube, have two serious problems. Classify the model does really don't, doesn't uh, predict fault. And the rules that SonarCube declare as uh, fall prone are less prone of what introduce cause melts, no bug. Out of the uh, uh, 57 violations classified as bug, out of the 202, only two are fall prone with the low importance. Bugs violation are not more fault prone than other violation. And this is the example that I explained before. Two others rule instead of 112 result uh, half as important as squid 112. The RFE result in a total of 37 violations identified by the algorithm. In conclusion, Sonar cube classification of rule must be revised. Refactoring of violations should be carried out on carefully by software company. Research and technical depth should most focus on rule violation. And static code measuring violation must be both taken into account in software quality analysis. 
Just uh, another uh, um, um, conclusion that is not written here. Remember that if you refactor something that is not right to be refactored, that is not the reason of your problem, probably you will create a much more problem than you have. This is important. Because resolving a bug, probably you can introduce other different technical items that probably can lead you to have an extra cost in the future in terms of interest of technical debt or in terms of other criticality in your code. Now you see the face of uh, Francesco, is turn of Francesco. Can I ask a question again about, uh, can, you, can you show the uh, confusion ma matrix? Yeah. I mean, I uh, again. Or even, okay, the, my question is about, uh, I understood that most of your uh, examples in the testing set are actually not bugs, right? Yeah. So actually you are getting nearly 100% accuracy if you always predict that this is not a bug, right? Uh, I don't understand, sorry. So I mean, if you go to the uh, actual like persistence, about the precision of solar cube of the model? The for both of them, actually. I mean, if you are having like 99% of the uh, test set, it's not a bug. If you predict not a bug, you are getting 99% of accuracy, right? But so I think we saw a cube, yes. Yeah, but also in your own models. Did I understand something wrong? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, but okay, my yes. comment was that are you winning this baseline at all? Sorry? Are you winning this baseline of having a single prediction all the time. Yeah, we, are we are considering that baseline, but there is nothing else we can do. I mean, that's the usual problem of machine learning and pattern recognition. We have um, very, very strongly unbalanced data set. That's unfortunately yeah. something that happens. Thank you. Francesco? Um, one more thing about this, actually. That's also why for the machine learning techniques, we use this AUC model instead of the precision. For the big, big yeah, <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> solved a bit the problem of this one percent, ninety-nine percent. Yeah, that's me. I'm Francesco. I'm a PhD student at Tampere University under the co-supervision of Davide and Eki Utten from Machine Learning Group. Uh, I will be studying uh, anomaly detection uh, applied also in software engineering and. Uh, goal would be to find let's say, a suitable deep learning technique for automatic detection that it would be able to be applied in as many cases as possible. And uh, at the moment, uh, for regarding anomaly detection, there are quite some problems. One of them is, again, like very unbalanced data. Most of the cases are not anomalies. We are interested in knowing what is the anomaly. But when training a model, of course, most of the data is normal. So one of the more, more um, one of the things that will be goals of my research will be how to solve this kind of problem. And at the moment, uh, with well, another little background on anomaly detection. Anomaly is something different from the rest of the data. We can see, for example, when there is a spike where it shouldn't be, or for example, in an ECG when there is some pose or some wrong pattern, let's say, so it may indicate a problem. So the goal would be like to, for anomaly detection is to understand when that is happening and if we're able any way to predict it or to predict this kind of anomalous behavior. One of the uh, tools that we are investigating now is, again, out, uh, autoencoders. Autoencoders are uh, based, of course, deep learning, so neural networks. They are nothing but a specular neural network which its goal 
for this uh, anomaly detection tools is to represent itself. So once we give an input, the goal of the autoencoder is to learn a shorter representation of the same, which is in the middle, and output, reconstruct the input with as low error as possible. Of course, with the normal case, so normal data, this would be uh, ideally the same without any error. In the anomalous case, once the model is trained, it's not able to reconstruct it. So the error will be much bigger. As a visual example, uh, this is an example just on the MNIST dataset, so n written digit. In a normal case, the top one, we have the number five, it turns to reconstruct itself. We have the same number five, and the loss over there is very low. In the abnormal case, meaning that it was a really bad written five, it is not able to recognize it, it is reconstructed, and again, we have a very high loss. So what this can be applied is uh, to set a threshold. Define a threshold above which is considered an anomaly. And that is actually, again, one of very big problem because we can't, I mean, the problem is in lock, um, individuate what this threshold is. And the application of this work, again, as I said at the beginning, the idea is to have as a wide range of, yeah? So you made the analysis training, but after it, you, you trained an autoencoder, then you have the bigger error if you have an anomaly. Uh, yes, because for the normal data, it's easier for it to learn how to represent it. And it's easier for it to remember what, I mean, normal is something that it should repeat itself and should be very clear. So for example, in this case of the five, Normal cases meaning that all the fives are more or less that shape, so it learns very well to represent it. In the moment in which they have a very different shape like this one, it doesn't know how to do that. And that can be considered an anomaly. And yeah, regarding the application, uh, well, uh, sorry, um, <coughs> just to clarify, um, are you using as, as the training data, the, the actual source code, uh, I could also think of using like the abstract syn syntax tree of, of that source code. Uh, well, at the moment we don't know yet. So actually, I've started two months ago, so I'm still in the okay. initial, very, very initial phase, just going around, see what is there, and try to understand where we can start. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why also the application are quite wide, so yeah, it can be applied, of course, in computer vision as it is here, or for example, identifying something wrong in some object. I don't know, you show up image of a car or a part of a car and you saw, okay, this is broken, this is right. Or in sensor data, anomalies in, I don't know, construction business, for example, comes to my mind. If we have a sensor on some excavator or something, we can, or an engine, we can come to know and individuate when it's not normal anymore, something is wrong or in software engineering. So if there is a anomalous use of the resources of the computer or like, again, the metrics that we were talking before, so if they change too much, when it is too much, when, it's, uh, when it is causing a problem in the actual code, when it will create a bug, that will be maybe in the next step. Um, no, I, I'm not moving, so. Okay, I um, substitute the other PhD student knew the Sarimaki, sorry for the, the pronunciation, I'm not Finnish, of course. And this is the, about the identification of road causes of technical debt issues. This is uh, the main topic of research uh, of me and Nudi, of course. And uh, what we would like to investigate. We would like to be sure about the root causes uh, of, uh, for example, a fault uh, as uh, I explained before, we uh, have the correlation value about the fault related to a technical, a technical items, for example, fault and cause maths. Using the historical data, as uh, we pres I presented before, we have also the idea about uh, that there is a relation between uh, a cause maths, for example, and a fault. But we cannot declare that the C specific cause smell is the root cause of fault. Because for declaring this one, we should conduct a control experiment. How many of you know what is a control experiment? 
control experiment for, uh, of course, that you, you know everything. <laughs> exactly. And uh, a control experiment is what uh, is done in, in uh, medicine, for example, when you test a specific, uh, a specific molecular and you want to test uh, the effectiveness of this molecular. You divide the population into parts, selecting by randomly. You have the treatment and a placebo. And you, with uh, a, a long experiment, can derive the, the, uh, the real root cause of uh, uh, the, the variable that you take into control. And in a control experiment, you have to consider just one variable. If you have two variables to take into control, it's not anymore a control experiment. You can have a quasi-control experiment, but not, it's not well um, see from the community. And this is the example. We should have the two identical po uh, pots with the same uh, uh, number of bin and you take under control the quantity of water. In one, you give the water. In the other one, you give not the water. And you see what's happened at the end. You have uh, nine out of 10 sand prouts, and without water, you have zero. What you can see, that without water, you cannot have sprout. Basing with the historical data, it's not possible to do it, because with historical data, you cannot conduct control experiment by default. What we now are to, uh, using it uh, through a collaboration with the University of Madrid, uh, it's to investigate other kind of um, techniques that are applied in medicine that have the observational study. In observational study, you, based on the historical data, you can have an approximation of the control experiment because you divide the historical data into part, like you, did, you do in the normal control experiment. And, you, and this is the only uh, test that is conducted in medicine in order to be sure about the cause rose analysis. But the other problem that we have in our domain is that we have dependent data and not independent data. Because the assumption that you have in the normal analysis is that you should have data independent. In our domain, the data are dependent because what's happened now, it's related to what happened in the fault, in the past, sorry. It's not something that you can consider isolated from uh, the past. And uh, the example are, for example, the code committed depend on the code present in the repository. The memory consumption depend on the available memory on the running process. Or the amount of bug produced depend on the developer skills. Software engineering researchers adopt machine learning techniques for independent data. But this is not right because uh, we have dependent in reality. But in order to apply several techniques or several approaches, we, do the, we, we um, use the assumption that the data are independent. But this is an, a mistake. And we could have several other options available that now we have in under investigation in our time series, Markov chains, that consider the data dependent and not independent. Results are often different, and we uh, have uh, some examples available in, letter, in literature when apply Markov chains or logistic regression. Mm, what's happened? Okay. Now the conclusion. I, con I can conclude. I have the power to conclude, of course. Uh, in this presentation today, we show you probably uh, in, in some of the major uh, uh, research that uh, our four are conducting in this moment about data-driven software engineering. Uh, David explained to you uh, the, the, the main concept about data-driven uh, data software engineering. 
and uh, the, the continuous monitoring data ops platform that we are uh, constructing. I explained to you just an example about the predicting fault with the SonarCube model, uh, a case study based on historical data. Francesco presented uh, you the idea to deep learning for anomaly detection because also anomaly is important in order to uh, retrieve a technical problem, uh, identify correctly technical problem in the source code. And then I present uh, the, the idea that uh, I am uh, with David uh, conducting with the other PhD student, Nudi, about the identification of root causes of technical issues using depending data and not independent data. This is probably all. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> you would be welcome. Of course, we are also welcome uh, to have some of you on board. So if you have some data, or if you want to investigate some of what we already investigated, or even if you want to apply any of the results we have in your company, or even in your toy project, why not? We are, happy. We are welcome to participate. We are a university, uh, so our technology uh, readiness status is not the same as companies. So I would say that the technology status is still at the research prototype level. So that's why we don't have, I would say, uh, production ready prototypes. We don't have tools. I mean, I wish I can have a tool, so I would have sold it uh, if I had something. Uh, so we, we are experts in uh, conducting experiments, yeah. conducting case studies. Yeah. But of course, we need, uh, we need data in order to also in order to conduct our research without data is not possible. First question out of curiosity, uh, who of you have been using SonarCube or who have somebody close to you working with SonarCube? Only one hand. Or also other tools, for example, there are uh, cast. Or some other, other static analysis tools for software quality. Yeah. Okay. And Your impression? Your impression? You are satisfied to use and you probably I now discover what? Now you have the proof that you were was right. Yeah, there is limited, uh, I would be really interested to know what languages you have been analyzing. Java. Java, okay. Because Java is a big paper, but there are languages where it's done. Now, we have the fortune uh, to have an agreement with the SonarCube to help SonarCube uh, from the research point of view, because uh, we explain these results to SonarCube, we say, you have the power to create uh, a brilliant um, tools because it's not easy to, to develop and to put on the market this tool and to become probably one of the most important leader on the market. But the problem is, again, you have to suggest right activities to be a factor. For example, in my main, uh, in my main project, I would like to develop a recommender tools, uh, recommender system to help developers to write better code. But if I suggest the activities to be refactored manually, automatically, with SonarCube, probably I will fail. Because I suggest to you to do something that is not useful, that is not what you have to do. And again, if you do something that is not properly the right activity, are you sure that you not introduce other technical uh, items that create uh, much more uh, imp uh, important and dangerous technical uh, issues at the end? We are not sure about this one. And uh, of course, uh, also another problem in the data sonar cube is the huge number of violation rules. 500.05. When David went in September to speak with the CEO of SonarCube and he discovered that they are in approaching to release 505 rules, he had an earth attack probably. Because say, okay, guys, bye bye, because it's, it's impossible to take under control 505 rules. With the bad classification that they have, not with the right classification, because are always. Anyway, if you have, 
We are interested to fine tune the sonar cube model, but not only sonar cube, even if you have any other static uh, analysis tool and you want to train it on your system, if you have at least a thousand commits, 500 folds, uh, uh, we can start uh, doing this kind of work. Uh, but we need historical, historical data. I mean, we cannot predict anything uh, just with few data points. So we need at least a thousand commits, 500 folds uh, to start with. No, no, we'll... <laughs> well, why, I mean, it could be like a portfolio of projects. Sometimes we have a small company that have something like 20 projects written by the same team of developers. Yeah, if, if you read better, send your competitors' products. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, comments? If not, then thank you very much. Thank you. And next, we have Mikko Pohja talking about some robocars. Let's switch the machines. Hello, is this on? Yeah. Hello. Check. <clears throat> yeah, welcome on my behalf also. And thank you, David, Valentin, and Francesco. Uh, this talk is about uh, RC cars and autonomous racing. And I'm actually a web developer, and still I'm here in a data science meetup. So I'm more on the lightweight side of the track than the previous presenters. But let's look at this. Uh, we have this car called what? No, nope. car called Marku. This one. Uh, and why do we have this is because I get excited quite easily and someone found this open source robocar project online and, and naturally uh, the founder was from Helsinki or the guy who found this online uh, so I had to challenge them to a race without knowing anything about autonomous vehicles or, or deep learning. So I, I told them that please order the hardware for us, us also and we are going to tell you how it's done. And it's now a few months later and we have the car and the software and, and everything is running almost smoothly and at least uh, better than our competitor's car. And we also have presence online so Marku.ai and, and this uh, Twitter account you can go follow. And we also have, have a multi-person team, so I'm not in, al alone in this. So we are like, like four, four to five regular in our team and, and some extra people doing stuff now and then. And why Marku? It's about, uh, it was an accident. 
we, we just we decided that that our car won't have any limits so it's all maximum attack and if you know rally rally english or or finnish rally english there was this saying from marco aleen that and now maximum attack so that's how we're rolling our maximum is not not in the sky yet but you'll see uh, and why are we doing this as a company is that uh, everyone is doing AI and by everyone I, I mean both Futurize and other companies and, and inside Futurize people are, are doing much AI in the cloud with plenty of resources and digital world and, and so on and this was something that can be done in a physical world with, with, with physical hardware and, and moving parts and still it's AI so, so it's pretty interesting at least to me that it's, it is so tangible and with the physical world it's really easy to, to try stuff and, and make connections between the abstract deep learning world and, and the real world and of course autonomous vehicles are all over the place like in media and and, and everywhere and last it's a great conversation starter with anyone to tell that we're doing this AI car inside someone might call it a toy car but it's not then the hardware we have this RC car, which is like like a plain plain RC car you can go and buy in in an RC so shop or online. It ha has the basic motor and steering server and battery and stuff. And what we're added is Raspberry Pi and camera, and also another battery for the Raspberry for uh, reasons like. We, we don't want the Raspberry to shut down if, if, if we run the battery out by driving in circles. And no soldering required, so, so anyone can pretty much do the hardware stuff. Um, and then we have a servo shield, is like a trivia, but we have a certain hardware for the PVM generation which is uh, the, the um, control signal of the RC stuff like servos and, and speed controllers. And then the, we have the software which is called Donkey Car, like I said before. Uh, and one thing about Donkey Car is that the, one of the founders called Will Roscoe said, said in some interview that, that his, his main point has been the lightweight hardware doing awesome stuff so so that's what what at least our team is trying to live with is that we are going to use the raspberry and use our imagination and, and awesome software to get things going because there are also like more heavyweight uh, hardware like you could run this stuff on cloud or N Nvidia shields or something but we're going still with the Raspberry uh, then a bit getting started stuff if you want to do this by yourself so so they have awesome manuals and community so if you join their slack I mean donkey car slack and go asking they will help help you and and you you will get going quickly also the car assembly is no soldering required and and quite easy to do the software side is a ready made image for raspberry and and some some python magic on the desktop which which you will be using training the model then you have to uh, make up little calibration steps like I I may have to mention this out aloud but but two hours ago our other car 
drove straight to the wall because we didn't calibrate it properly. But this one is still intact, and hopefully the other one is soon. <coughs> Good luck, Antti. <laughs> Behind the screen. Then we have this Bluetooth controller for driving manually, and then, then it's all set up. So quite easy. The actual documentation mentions two hours from, from box to driving, but that's quite optimistic. Uh, then about the hardware. Uh, what you can see in the images is our one of our broken car bodies. And actually, it wasn't even AI who broke it, but blame the humans. But the hardware side is or can be quite hard sometimes. If, if stuff uh, stops working, it's quite hard to or harder to debug than software. And yeah, about the software. Uh, List views after list views, but the car is running rasp on Raspberry Pi and using Python, TensorFlow, and Keras. So pretty basic deep learning uh, stack. And on desktop, you uh, you run the de TensorFlow for for training the model because obviously Raspberry is is lightweight hardware, so so it would take ages to train on on that. Uh, then about the AI side, mm, this is supervised ray, <laughs> supervised learning or racing, and what that means is uh, maybe obvious to someone. But what what that basically means is that the car is trying to mimic human behavior. So, so the process is so that first step is to practice. As you saw before, you can break the car pretty easily. And the cars are actually quite fast. So you have to practice a bit. But af after uh, the driving works somehow manually, you gather training data. So there is a, a recording mode in the Donkey Car software, which records uh, data points and after you run manually like 10 to 20 laps or something, you can e even get going with that, that little amount of data. And as a reminder, the car will drive or try to drive like you did. So if you're bad, the car will be at best as bad as you were. Then the training step. You get the training data or uh, recorded training data and train the model. And there is is already uh, ready-made utilities for training the model, so you don't you don't have to in invent those by yourself. And then you just take the model, put it in the Raspberry, and start the car. And what we have done is we have the controller for for driving it manually but also toggling the AI model on and off so we can save it if if it if if it runs from us and that happens and uh, as it it is with deep learning as i have understood there is a significant possibility that the model won't work but some, sometimes you get lucky. The training data it gathers is uh, it's recording at maximum 20 frames per second. And a single frame is saved, and the uh, corresponding throttle and steering values from the exact moment when the frame was saved are. are uh, record it into a file. So in the end, you have plenty of images and corresponding angle and throttle values. So angle means uh, the amount of 
uh, steering value on the front wheels and throttle is yeah throttle and those are taken from the controller so everything is from minus one to one so you can even reverse and this is one utility we have built for uh, visually uh, comparing this data or going through the data. So we have this this video like like sequence and you can see on the top left corner the steering values and throttle values from the controller, from the guy driving the car. And also we have an accelerometer or, or inertial measurement unit which has the acceleration values, and that's the red dot on the lower left left corner. And then we ha have or had, it's not in use right now, but we have this uh, special bumper we made, and it has these sonar modules for emergency braking, and that would have saved our other, other car before if it w was in use. So basically it just measures the distance to the next next solid thing in front and breaks if something's gonna hit. And then when we get the data, this is something we have added and the donkey car doesn't have this currently made in. But uh, we figured out that we have uh, quite quite small amounts of data and uh, as I said you can get going with small amount but we have actually made tools for for multipl multiplication of the data so we we're using this data augmentation so this is the original uh, training data and then the first step we do is flip it so I don't know if it's if if you can see it from from here but the images are flipped and also the steering values so so now we have double double the amount of data and then we have this disco mode which is called brightness augmentation and this is for uh, for simulating this office pretty much because we had we had this track in the fifth floor right here and we have huge windows and when the sun sun rises in the morning it's it's from one way and when it goes down in the afternoon it's the other way and with the huge windows it's pretty bright in here so the car worked quite badly if if the data was recorded on the morning and, and used in the afternoon. So we have this brightness, um, brightness augmentation. And uh, as you can see in the video like <laughs> sequence, it doesn't make any sense for a human, but, but in the training, uh, training step, the uh, training of the TensorFlow gets only a single image at a time. So it doesn't matter if the subsequent frames are, are darker or lighter than the others. And then we have this shadow augmentation, which just adds these sharp shadows. And these augmentation steps are really actually in, in proven they themselves in, in real use. So they, they make it possible to actually make the car run and stay on the track. And then the convolutional neural network, uh, we're still using the original donkey car architecture. So this is this is a uh, convolutional neural network, so it, it has five convolution layers and then some dense layers and dropouts and, and two outputs. So a single image goes in and angle and throttle values come out as a prediction. So as you can see this is quite basic but but this is 
uh, we haven't tried yet to make it like super big, but at least the assumption is that the Raspberry will will suffocate on the uh, bigger neural network. And also we have tried uh, to modify this a bit, like adding history history data and, and stuff, but it happens that this default architecture just works better than our ours, at least this far. Then the training step is, is done, now how TensorFlow is trained, but we, we're using this uh, tensor board, which I think ships with TensorFlow currently. So you can visually see, look, look, look how the training is going and compare to other models trained in before, which is actually quite nice, nice way to look at this because at, at some point if, if the training is going like really in the wrong direction, uh, you can just kill it and think about the data or, or the changes you've made. And yeah, it, uh, on my laptop with, with GTX 100 and 1050, it takes like, like 30 minutes max to get a decent model, so it's quite fast to train. Then some lessons learned. Uh, this is actually our first successful round in here. I don't know if this is as awesome to you as it was for me looking at the car actually doing something. And I assume or we assume that this was pretty much overfitting to stuff that doesn't belong in the in the track. So my guess was that if, if we just remove the ribbons in, in there it would still be going because it, it can see too much. Like the black black stage in here and, and all the sofas and, and chairs and tables. And also the office environment, the brightness and the sunshine is, is hard for the model, at least if you're not using the data augmentation. But some, please. This is one, one thought from yesterday, actually. Uh, Overfitting is something that you're paying attention to something that's not relevant. But I, I just began to think about this, this Porsche record lab and, and how, how that Timo guy is each driving. And uh, I would say that's overfitting. He's, he's looking at all the stuff that's not part of the ra racetrack. Like this is, is this famous famous instruction that when you drive on the Nürburgring Nordschleife into the carousel, you have to look at the tallest tree because you're you're not going to see the actual corner. You like look at the tree. So I I would say that's overfitting. Well, a human may be able to recover if someone goes and, and, and like tears the tree down, but what I'm trying to show in here is that if you're, if we're going to make the car drive li really fast, we should be more focusing on the overfitting side, side than on the generic like street car side. Then about the single frame records, uh, this is a Question for you, you don't have to answer. Uh, how much throttle should you use if you see this from minus one to one? Like, how on earth could, could even that, that model 
predict anything based on this. So the throttle pedal is is at best when your manual driving was like uh, static. If you go go fast and then let go the, of the throttle and and let it roll and then maybe brake a bit, it it may look like just noise to the training. So uh, some ideas about fixing this is to use uh, some recurrent neural network like LSTM or more like hardware-wise, we could add a speedometer. But as I told before, hardware is pretty hard, so adding a, adding a speedometer is, is actually quite hard on these, these machines. And uh, another example of this these single frame records is if you look at the throttle pedal in here, this is some training data that was driven quite hard or quite fast. And I would say this is like pretty much noise and not data. Then uh, something, this is like where we are now. This is AI driving. We have a track downstairs on the fourth floor, a, a bit bigger track, and we trained the model and, and or recorded the training data and trained the model, and this is what this is doing. And again, again, I'm pretty proud of our doings because it, it actually looks like it's driving. Well, it, it oscillates a bit and, and and stuff, but it doesn't matter if, if it goes full, like clean laps, almost clean laps. And then we have the thing going, and we're on a motivational hole, that wise, because it's working by, by butter. Um, some future steps. Uh, there is this. Uh, Neural network visualization library called, called Keras Vis, which we tried, and it, it tries to emphasize the actual pixels that that uh, have the biggest uh, influence on the on the prediction or the output. So as we can see in here, this was quite a good model, and. As you can see, it's it's mainly focusing on on these these uh, lines, like two meters from the car front. So this is this is actually pretty much what it it should be looking. But if we're going to improve it and make make another architecture for the neural network, we should be digging this more and and try to run these tools before we let the car crash itself. And then this is our end game, our dream. Uh, this wave company is doing this uh, learning to drive in a day. I think they, they have the actual actual car with a human inside pretty with a pr pretty tight grip on the kill switch but they're using reinforcement learning so what what that basically means is that the car starts driving and gets penalty or 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 positive points and what it's doing is it's trying to optimize the points it's getting uh, I don't know about the throttle in here. I, I I guess it could be like static, but but at least the steering is is almost working. So they have much uh, much more powerful hardware than our Raspberry has, but but we're going to do it some way or another. And some some things we're worried about is is that we we have a simulator for the donkey car. 
and you can train it. And uh, people have been doing that training, reinforcement learning inside the simulator, and it, it is actually working. But if you use a simulator, you can just fast forward, and, and you're inside the digital simple world. So it may be that if you're doing this in real life with the Raspberry and, and maybe some, some laptop connected, then it could be just too slow. So it, it takes like 10 years to, to train the model. But this is something we're going to try. Then the architectures. Uh, LSTM, LSTM was, was for the uh, speed, because uh, predicting the throttle pedal value is, is hard. And also for the tight corners and stuff, you uh, an actual race driver probably knows where he's coming from, and not just these flashbacks like the, our current model. And then transfer learning is in one is one thing. Like we we take some cat or dog kind of model and take some of the uh, neurons from there and use it at, as a starting point, if it's possible, because those models are usually quite big and ours is like five convolutional layers only. So we don't know yet. Then. Uh, like in the previous presentation, there was this variable autoencoder, VAE, uh, and that's used in in some uh, some articles, at least online, for for compressing the image data. So, I guess in effect, it it's making the predictions faster because you can you can train the autoencoder offline and then just take the autoencoder model, model inside the car and you have the uh, like the magical compression algorithm and you can do the prediction with 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 like 16 neurons and people have actually done it so it's possible and then uh, one dream <laughs> is the uh, world models paper. I'm not going to go deep into that, but you can Google it. They have really awesome blog post in, in this interactive form. And it's about reinforced learning using this autoencoder stuff and LSTM. So basically what, what the, what's the biggest thing in that is that they, they can train the whole model whole reinforcement learning model offline without the real world and then just transfer it to the uh, car. And that's possible because they they use this autoencoder for simulating the whole physical world, kind of. But if you're interested, please Google it. It's It's really awesome. And Finally, we what we're going to do is we're going to remember the community because this is an awesome project. And what we have done is, is uh, Antti has done these 3D print models which we are using for attaching all the electronics, all the extra electronics into the car. So we're, we're going to give those back, back to the community and also code. Code we have done with the utilities and stuff. And one thing we're thinking about is this local community event. Uh, if we get enough interest for all of you to go buy all these cars as soon as possible. Because they have, uh, in the United States, they have this massive D DIY robo cars community, and they have events which have like a few hundred people uh, present and, and tens of cars. So if you're interested in this, this stuff and would like your own car, please come, come talk to me after this. And then I, it seems I'm early on the schedule. So, so 
Thank you very much. And and do you have questions? Uh, you were saying that you have limited resources. Are you already hitting the ceiling or or how far are you from there? I was afraid you so one might ask we haven't really really like scientifically tested our frame rates or so but maybe the biggest point is that we cannot just do anything we want because of the limited resources. But uh, I doubt it would help us if we had the NVIDIA shield or, or some other more powerful, because the, it, the actual car is currently working so, so good. I have actually like three questions. Uh, maybe I can ask all of them straight away. Like yeah. first, the camera orientation. Did you try the different orientation that you see, like maybe more features in the camera? So if you tilt it up, that you see the continuation of track and try to learn. So is it optimized? Second, well, like maybe I'll ask all, all straight. Like yeah. second is the edge detection. So you were to talking about the noise in the image from the light and all that. So did you just try to filter it out and just get the track as a just edge and just have that as an input? And the third, uh, but I guess that's the case if you have really a, like a simulator uh, for the future, like genetic algorithms maybe? Uh, yeah, let's start on the camera angle. So, so yeah, it's it's like the best we could do because uh, in the beginning the camera was like uh, straightforward; it had no angle, uh, and at least it looked like it was learning wrong stuff. Because if you look at the ceiling in here, here there's quite quite plenty of stuff on the ceiling and and plenty of furniture and everything and how the D DIY robo cars races are telling in their rules in the uh, Oakland or wh wherever they are uh, they have three meters from the track to anything else so they have this like this empty area where the track is and as you can see, we have no empty area in here. There's too much stuff. So that's the best camera angle we could uh, we could get. And also, what we are doing is that we are cropping the frame, so it it is pretty close to the horizontal value, the up, upper upper edge of the frame. So it should be seeing as far as possible from that height. But of course. Uh, this is going a bit superficial, but it's ugly to <laughs> raise it above that. So it, it doesn't look nice anymore, but probably it would run better if the car or camera would be higher. And then you have the genetic algorithms. And the edge detection on the picture, like of the track. Uh, yeah, we're, we're uh, trying to using some open CV filter, filtering and, and finding edges and stuff. And actually with this track, you can now see it could be even possible. But we used to have the track in here and with this concrete floor, the floor is actually quite shiny. So if you, if you just filter out based on, on contrast or, or find some um, threshold, then uh, the shiny parts of the concrete are pretty much white and so so are the lines so well we didn't try that hard but but something some like naive idea is that the neural network will handle it so so maybe it would be wise to to use some pre-filtering and and actually about the variational autoencoder uh, that we have thought about using that for compressing the track in a way that it would be able to just return, return the lines and not any pattern on the floor or, or anything. So uh, that in mind, yes, we have thought about the filtering pretty much. 
And then the generic algorithms were not that far yet, but, but we have th talked about using the simulator and extending it so that it would be closer to our real world, like this office or this, this carpet or, <coughs> or, or fine tune the car behavior so it behaves more like in the simulation, more like it's working outside the, or in the real world. But about genetic algorithms, no, we haven't even talked about those. Uh, one more question, like you compared with the Helsinki team. So do you think that uh, you had better training set? That's why you won? And how did you win? Did you have the same uh, track? We, we didn't win, we will win in June. <laughs> but uh, I think in the the actual con we're having this whole futurized wide uh, event like our summer party and and this other event and uh, the race will be in there and and probably all the training data recorded before are are unusable because you you go from one place to another. Could be that some someone just makes or has good enough environment or good enough filtering or something that but i I doubt those data cannot be used again, so the race will probably happen like the do d i y robocars events that you go there and record the data and train the model and then then use the model trained in in the premises Um, how big is the image source image that you are using? Uh, currently, it's, it's 240 pixels wide and 100 pixels in height. Okay. But that we we already know that 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 could be like too accurate. But yeah, yeah. I was just going to suggest that you can also get a training cycle uh, faster when you like. Make it four times smaller, like like if it's one hundred twenty wide and stuff like that. Yeah, we should definitely try that because we're actually using bigger images than the default Donkey Car project. Yeah, uh, what I noticed was that um, well, the the amount of information is um, um, in a sense limited in the pictures, so it might be yeah. that you can make it. A, quite small if, if you uh, find a way to um, uh, stress the, the white markers. Yeah, and, and one thing a bit related is that we're using color images and, and probably we don't need the yellow line to be yellow. Yeah, yeah. It's just an uh, idea that's probably not u very useful. Uh, is it that throttling is the difficult part, right? Uh, yeah. So what if you r don't learn that very much? Because actually throttling could be very simple. You are having like two different speeds. If you are driving, it's just depending on steering a an angel. If it's, an, uh, if it's not that uh, big, you just have you are driving faster and faster. If you are having some kind of like turning, then you could have a smaller speed or something like that. Probably something like that would be much faster than our car yeah. is right now. Yeah, because it's actually a little bit depressing that the foreign <laughs> this kind of stuff is better than actual machine learning. Well, actually, I have to uh, add that. Uh, they're keeping track on the fastest times they've done in the ev in their uh, United States meetups, and currently a human is leading, so a human driver has the fastest time, and then it's I, I think then the second fastest is the like the stupid program without neural network and the neural network is almost as fast but using OpenCV and PID controller or PIDs and stuff like that 
without any neural networks and deep learning, it's actually faster still. But uh, it's, I think that uh, in the most recent meetup, they were like almost even already. But uh, I haven't seen the code, so maybe they're just cheating. But yeah, about the throttle thing, we have in here the, the this tight corner, and this is the one point where we have to drive slower, because the floor is quite slippery and it, it will go off the track if you're going too fast. And actually, we have this thing we are we we call cruising mode, which is like a constant throttle, and it's nice until that corner because that constant throttle is too much. Another? Okay. Yeah, that's actually one, one ream of hours, but I don't know if 20 frames per second is in, in, enough. Yeah, not in this car, but yeah. Yeah, and more power. So, thank you everyone. Thank you, so that was the official part of the program, but uh, we will have the car here doing laps hopefully in a few moments. We'll see. And also there's drinks and some pizza left, so please grab those. And uh, also we would like to receive some feedback, so there's one canvas at the exit, so Please fill some, some feedback to the post-its and, and leave those to the canvas. But thank you for attending. Thanks. Uh, open TV. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what it is.